Alright, <clears throat> welcome to our third video of our Unit 7. This one's uh, going from the nuclear model to the Bohr model. So, the light that we see with our eyes, it's called visible light, is one type of electromagnetic radiation. Which, yes, means that what's coming into our eyes is radiation. So, a common way of thinking of light, though, is by thinking of it as a wave. So, by wave, I mean this is kind of what light does. Now, I'm not saying this is right or wrong. It's kind of changed a bit since, well, there's actually many ways to look at it. So, anyways, it has both a frequency, meaning basically how, I don't actually quite remember how to describe it, but this would have a higher frequency than this. It's how, there we go, spaced out the wave is. And a wavelength, which is basically the distance of the wave. So, that's kind of what a wave means, and we've got those two properties of light. Ultimately, all light moves <clears throat> at the same speed, and that's about 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And as such, we have a relationship that we can see between our frequency and our wavelength, which is lambda nu, it's actually a, basically a V, but it's technically a Greek letter, equals C, our speed of light. where lambda represents the wavelength of the light, nu is our frequency, and c is the speed of light. Now, our whole visible spectrum of light, all the colors we see, are only in a narrow range of about 400 nanometers to about 750 nanometers. So there are many other wavelengths like x-rays, um, UV rays, microwave rays actually, um, that are different wavelengths and frequencies, but the light that we see is between about 400 and 750. All right, we have an example. Yellow light given off by a sodium vapor lamp that's used for public lighting has a wavelength of 589 nanometers. What's our frequency? So, you are going to be using the equation I gave you. I'm sorry. Lambda nu. But it also may help to know that one nanometer is equal to 10 to the negative ninth meter. So with that, take a few minutes, come back. All right. So we have a wavelength of 589 nanometers, but our speed of light is measured in meters per second. So we got to get those to basically the same unit. doesn't really matter what. Um, I'm going to turn our wavelength so instead of 589 nanometers. This is now 5.89 times 10 to the negative 7th times our new equals 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meter per second. Divide both sides by 5.89, you get that our frequency. All right, so our frequency is 5.09 times 10 to the 14th. And actually, our unit is either S to negative 1 or 1 over S, or hertz, actually, if you know a little bit about computers. So there you go. That's our frequency. Just plug them in and solve for it. So, while thinking of the light as a wave actually does help explain tons of properties, it doesn't explain why certain objects actually change their color of light when they are heated. And while, honestly, today, I'll admit, I don't really care about this. In late 1800s, when the plum pudding model and all that stuff was coming out, people were really concerned with that. They were wondering, why are things changing color? Why does metal suddenly become red? Why is this a different color red? It's, it's just freaking them out. So, in 1900, a gentleman named Max Planck, or Planck, actually, I think it's Planck, proposed that energy can either be released or absorbed by atoms in discrete chunks of minimum size. So they're not just released, you know, just however they want. They actually come out in chunks. And he called this minimum quantity of energy a quantum. And he proposed that the energy of a single quantum, which we're going to denote by E, equals a constant times the frequency of that radiation. Now, this eventually will solve the color issue. It just doesn't seem like it yet. 
So E equals Planck's constant. Nope. Still don't know whether it's Planck or Planck. Times our frequency. Where his constant is 6.626 times 10 to the negative third joule second. Kind of a number he wrote. Not really sure how he got it. But there's Planck's constant. So, in 1905, Albert Einstein used Planck's theory to explain the photoelectric effect, which is another issue, which is that light shining on a clean metal surface causes electrons to be emitted from the surface. So you shine light on metal and it pops off electrons. And Einstein's like, that's kind of weird. So, to do this, Einstein assumed that the radiant energy striking the metal surface actually behaved like a stream of tiny energy packets. So not only do they come in packets... But he's now saying they're a little stream of a packet. And he said each packet is like a particle of energy. And he called these little particles of energy photons. Now, keep in mind, we started this by saying light behaves like a wave. And now, Einstein's saying they behave like particles. It's a little weird, but we'll get back to that. He deduced, then, that the energy of each photon, which, again, are made up of multiple quantums, are equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the light. The same equation, <clears throat> but he related this to the basic packet of them, if you will. That helps explain why some form of radiation, like, you know, x-rays, actually cause damage. Because what it turns out is that the greater the frequency of the radiation the more energy it actually hits our tissues with. That's basically what Einstein proved. Planck actually said that light comes in groups. Einstein said that the actual energy official of that group comes with the frequency. To be honest, I don't see a whole lot of a difference, but they're pretty famous for it. And then finally, in 1913, Niels Bohr adopted this theory of energy being quantized, meaning you know it comes in groups or packets and theorized that electrons orbit nuclei in distinct orbits. Now, by the way, this is Niels Bohr. We've got this guy. Okay, where you got like the circles. That's Bohr. And he's saying that electrons move around nuclei in actual orbits. They're in paths. And he said that electrons only emitted or absorbed energy between, or it was as a photon, when changing between orbits. So... Basically, what ends up happening is Planck says that electrons release energy basically in packets, in groups. And Bohr basically then, and Einstein, Bohr and Einstein, take that a little bit farther and say that electrons are going to be going around in paths. Because remember, we originally had, Tom, the nuclear model was kind of electrons are on the outside. Bohr's saying they're actually moving in paths. And that color, as he said, that basically whenever they actually go um, up a level or out a level, they actually need a photon of energy. But whenever they fall back down, they'll actually release a photon energy. It ends up where that and each element will actually release... Let me see how to word this. It'll release a photon with a certain frequency and wavelength of a certain color. Basically, every element is actually a little bit different color. This is way back to that flame test I did last year where I just kind of burned stuff and you had different colors. So... Bohr says that they're in rings, and as they move between them, between what's called the ground state, which is like their normal day-to-day -day state, and then the excited state when energy is applied or taken, they will actually release photons, thus releasing colors. And all this comes down to the fact that energy is quantized, meaning basically Bohr says there are distinct orbits, and you won't find electrons anywhere between them. Okay? Okay. That is basically the Bohr model, that they go in paths and you won't find them between them. If they're going, you won't normally find them. If you'll only find them between them, if they're going from one path to the other, like they don't stay in the middle. There we go. So drawing a picture, as you saw, you got your nucleus and your electrons are basically out orbiting the nucleus. Draw circles with basic negatives on it. And that's the Bohr model. And that actually works. It's, it's pretty close to being right. Um, you'll see pretty soon what's wrong with it, but that's the Bohr model.